Thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak at this very interesting uh, mini symposium. Uh, my name is Andrew Duncan, and um, I'm going to present some recent results on uh, the analysis of a Stein based variation inference method known as Stein variational grade descent. So, this is joint work with Nick Nuskin and Lucas Brook. Very good. So, before I dive into the actual methodology, let me provide some context and motivation as to um, why the, uh, what this m methodology seeks to do. So, uh, a very common uh, uh, challenge in, in computational statistics is that we, we, we wish to, um, we have a density, typically in a high dimensional space, and we wish to, um, wish to characterize this distribution in the sense that we wish to produce samples from this distribution or compute expectations with respect to this density. And so, in many cases, this, this density will arise through a Bayesian I inference problem. And um, due to that fact, um, we, we typically only know the uh, we only know that this distribution up to uh, a normalization constant. And often uh, we are in sufficiently high dimensions that um, this normalization constant cannot be, is not readily available to us. So this of course has motivated numerous um, classical approaches based on Markov chain Monte Carlo and CMC. And so um, these sampling approaches are very generally applicable and uh, course they're, they're very well developed and they're a very mature field. The advantages of such methods are of course that they are asymptotically exact in the sense that with sufficient computational effort you can arrive arbitrarily close to the true solution. The disadvantages are that often getting con convergence to, that, to, the, to the true solution is uh, incredibly slow and so there's been a lot of recent work on approximate inference methods which seek to trade off asymptotic exactness for uh, increase in, in, in the speed of convergence. And um, so one such method which seeks to do this is based on the idea of deterministic maps. And so uh, I first saw this in the inference context in uh, a 2012 paper by Moselhi and Marzouk. Um, and so the general the idea is that if we have a, a set of particles which are distributed according to a prior, if we can learn a map which is able to transform um, the prior into the posterior distribution, then we can transport these particles along this transport map and very quickly generate samples, independent samples even, from the posterior distribution, albeit with some bias due to the approximation of the function. And um, this, of course, is an optimization problem. And so, uh, so um, computing such a transport map sounds like a daunting task, by, but by exploiting some um, some features of transport maps, such as, for example, the North uh, Rosenblatt rearrangement, um, is possible to, to do this in a, in a reasonably scalable way. And so um, the nice thing about this approach is that it has a natural um, variational characterization in the sense that um, the transport map that we're looking for is actually one which um, minimizes over the set of all admissible transport maps the KL, the kullback lab divergence between the um, transported distribution, uh, this is a push forward here, um, and the target distribution pi. And so this is the optimization um, problem that, that we solve to, to, to recover the transport map that we want. And um, so then a few years later in 2016, uh, Liu and Wang, two authors, um, published a, <coughs> a paper in the machine learning literature, which is known as uh, on a method called Stein variation gradient descent. And so the idea in this um, approach is very similar um, conceptually in that we, we, we have a system of particles and at each time we update them iteratively by moving them, pushing them along uh, a, a transport map T, which is actually um, of a very simple form. So basically what we do is we get each particle and we push it along a, a short distance along a vector field phi. And the challenge then is how do I find... Um, this fight every time step such that when we move these particles along we get closer and closer to the target distribution. And so the approach to finding this vector field is, is similar to formulate a variational problem and that we seek the, 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 um, we seek the vector field which maximizes the rate of decrease of the KL divergence between the transported particles and the target distribution we're seeking to approximate. And therefore, we're solving this variational problem over the set of admissible vector fields C. And the key observation of the authors, um, which is that this objective function here can actually be uh, 
expressed in closed form up to expectations in terms of this operator s of pi. And s of pi is what is known as a langevin stein operator. It's this first order differential operator here, which, um, so, so pi enters it through the gradient of the log of pi, and you notice that there's no dependence on the normalization constant of pi. And um, as one knows from Stein's method, this is a relatively well-studied object. And one of the key features of it is that if rho is equal to pi, then this term is equal to zero. And if I were to take uh, the supremum of this term over a sufficiently rich class of vector fields uh, phi, then that quantity is called a Stein discrepancy, and that will be zero if and only if rho is equal to pi. So in some sense, it offers some um, discrepancy or, or measurement of distance between uh, the two distributions. And so that's what is, is typically used for in, 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 in the Stein literature. Um, okay, and so then the question is, how do I solve this, this variational problem, given that I have this expression here? Well, then we, we resort to uh, using um, kernel-based approaches. So we choose C to be the unit ball of an appropriate reproducing kernel Hilbert space associated with the kernel K. And what happens is that then we can exploit the, the usual kernel trick to obtain a closed form for the minimizer phi, the minimizing vector field of that variational problem, closed form up to uh, expectations with respect to rho. And the key point is that this doesn't depend on the normalization constant of the target density. And so um, if we if we then plug everything in, we obtain obtain a set of update rules for each of the particles, which depends on all the other particles, so it's an interacting system. And so if I write V as minus log of the target distribution, I'll be using that throughout, then we, we, we see that it has this nice closed form with two terms here. Okay, so there, there are various scaling limits that we can take um, to recover more intuitive versions of, of, this, of this method which is known as SVGD. And so one of them, which is quite natural, is to take epsilon going to zero. In this case, we recover um, the, a continuum dynamics for each particle, which is described by an ordinary differential equation. And so the right-hand side of this ODE will have two terms. This term here takes the weighted average of the, um, the, the gradient of the log, uh, the log target distribution and moves the particles in that di direction. So this pushes the particles towards regions of high probability well, the second term here, this is actually a repulsion term between particles. It's, it'll be large. Uh, it'll push in the opposite direction of nearby particles. And the idea is that this seeks to enforce diversity between the particles so that they don't all collapse to a single mode. And the idea is that um, this dynamics, therefore, encourages efficient exploration of the state space while still um, being attracted to the, to the regions of high probability in such a way that you're, you're almost sampling from the target distribution. So another limit in which um, things um, become easier to study is, is when you have infinitely many particles. And so um, this is, of course, what's known as the mean field limit, and it was studied for SVGD by Lou, Lou and Nolan in 2018. And what they showed is that you can describe the, 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 the behavior of the system as n goes to infinity in terms of this density rho t for the particles, which evolves according to this nonlinear, non-local partial differential equation, known as a nonlinear focke planck equation. And although this looks quite daunting, actually it's quite convenient for analysis. So immediately from this expression, one can tell that the, uh, the rate of change of the kullback liber divergence between the target distribution and rho t is always decreasing, or at least it's never increasing. In particular, um, under some appropriate initial conditions, um, based on this observation, I can, I, can write, I can show that rho t will actually converge to the target distribution. So in the mean field limit, the algorithm behaves um, is, is correctly sampling from the target distribution. And the hope is that for n sufficiently large, um, the, the, this, um, the, uh, the, the <coughs> and the hope is that for n sufficiently large, the system um, does this in, in some approximate sense. Okay, so, okay, so our objective was to understand um, how fast um, rho t converges to pi. <clears throat> and the, the reason we're interested is because um, for Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, for Langevin dynamics, etc., um, this, this question is very well studied, and um, we understand relatively well conditions under which we can expect to get exponentially fast convergence to equilibrium, which of course is a, 
is very useful for Markov chain Monte Carlo applications and uh, when when we don't get those those conditions. And so um, what we did is we, we tried to compare it to some existing dynamics to try and draw some parallels. And so a natural starting point was uh, the Langevin dynamics. Uh, and yet at face value, looking at the two dynamics, you see that these are these are quite different from each other. So um, so for example, while Langevin dynamics or overdamp Langevin dynamics behave like an, o an SDE, um, the SVGD is very much a system of interacting ODs, and, and so is deterministic. And uh, for Langevin, the 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 the, the, um, the density uh, evolution is described by a, a linear local Fokker Planck equation. For the Stein um, case, it's it's described by this non-local, non-linear. Um, and partial differential equation and so it, it seems that in every sense these two are very different and yet there, there's one way in which they, they they look very similar to each other and that's the observation that both Langevin dynamics and Stein variation of gradient descent turn out to be gradient flows of the same objective function KL divergence but with respect to different underlying geometries and so what do we mean by gradient flows so there's a lot of ways to express gradient flow but but Maybe the easiest way for those who are not familiar is that we can we can always write down um, uh, we can always write down the dynamics for for the density rho at some time index m plus one as um, as the minimizer of the KL divergence between rho and pi plus um, some constraint which forces rho to be close to the previous step in some appropriate metric. And so for Langevin we have Jordan, Kinder, Leher, and Otto results, which tells us that Langevin dynamics, the density evolves according to, to this gradient flow formulation, where the distance here is the optimal transport of the Wasserstein 2 distance. And it turns out that um, uh, for Stein variation of gradient descent, we have a similar result, similar gradient flow formulation, except that the distance here is now something else called a Stein geometry. And so <coughs> really what this controls, it controls um, which directions you can move in and um, and how quickly you can move in each direction. And so that's what will differ between the two situations which make the two dynamics quite different. And so um, in the in the Langevin case, of course, we're quite familiar with Wasserstein geometry. Um, so the idea is that the um, <coughs> we, we look at, if we have two measures, mu0 and mu1, we can formulate the distance by looking at all possible vector fields which trans which can transport the mass in mu naught to mu one time dependent vector fields that is, and the distance will be the the norm of the, the smallest norm possible across all such admissible vector fields, and that gives you Wasserstein two. And it turns out that so this is of course the uh, the Benamou uh, Bernier formulation for uh, the optimal transport distance. And it turns out that Stein geometry and Stein distance has a similar characterization. And so, um, in the next few slides, I'll just I'll just describe very briefly how they how they mimic each how how they what parallels we can draw between them. And so, the first thing that will play a role, of course, you'd expect is the Kern. And so, to, to kind of characterize the effect of the Kern, I introduced this op operator TK rho. What this does, it will take a an, a function L two, um, and L2 of rho, and it will output something in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space by applying this smoothing operation here. And so this is a really nice smoothing operator, of course, you're, you're convolving effectively with a kernel. And in fact, the operator is bounded, compact, self-adjoint, positive definite, and you have a discrete spectrum of positive eigenvalues. So that's it's a very nice operator, uh, as we would expect for nice kernels. And so using this operator T, we can come up with a nice analogous concept of, of distance for this Stein geometry. And so the distance that we get is, is defined by the minimum RKHS norm over all the admissible vector fields. And this defines what we call an extended metric. And so um, it satisfies a lot of similar properties to the, to the Wasserstein distance, also an optimal transport distance, but with, with some modifications here. And once we have a concept of distance, of course, then one requires some other machinery geometric machinery, we have to identify the appropriate tangent space, etc. I'm going to skip over these details, but once we, once we have this, then we can actually compute in closed form what the gradient with respect to this uh, metric is for some functional f on the space of probability measures. So in our case, f would be KL divergence. It turns out that 
the gradient in this matrix so for f will actually be <coughs> this form here where tk rho is our smoothing operator and d rho by df is the pressure derivative of this um, operate this uh, objective function with respect to, to the measure rho which is its argument and so with this in mind then we can plug that in and we identify the gradient low uh, the gradient flow of kl divergence with respect to this time geometry and what we see is that it's actually given by this mean field pd which is the same one identified by lu lu and nolan in their 2018 paper and so what's interesting is that apart from identifying that it's a gradient flow which would be useful for analysis reasons we also have a recipe potentially for deterministic sampling methods. So if we choose a cost functional, here we chose KL, and we choose a geometry on, on the space of measures, then um, the, with those two in mind, um, one can derive a, a, a gradient flow PD for the cost functional with respect to the geometry. And if you can find a simulation scheme which is enclosed form and efficient based on that, that those gradient flow PD, then you can have a, an efficient algorithm for, for, for sampling from a particular distribution. Um, of course, the, the, the last issue is the, is, is the challenge. How do you find such, a, su su such a, a simulation scheme? So once we know that we can write down the evolution of the density in terms of this gradient flow, we can then ask questions about how fast does it converge to equilibrium. And so this, of course, relates, as it does in many optimization problems, to convexity of the objective function. And here it's, it's the KL divergence, but of course it has to be convexity with respect to the right geometry. And so as an informal theorem, if, if we take, um, if we look at the KL divergence and we look at it over all geodesics with respect to uh, a specific po uh, initial point and, and direction, and we can show that the, the second derivative um, of the scale divergence is strictly greater than zero for all such unit speed geodesics, then you can show that the KL divergence of rho t will, um, with respect to pi, will contract exponentially fast um, with rate given by this um, lower bound lambda. And so then what we really need to establish is, of course, the Hessian of this and, and to see whether we can actually derive such a lower bound. And um, so we can actually work out an expression for the geodesics in a, in a particular uh, <coughs> in a particular direction of psi, and we can compute the Hessian. And in fact, we can show, as with all as with Langevin dynamics, that the Hessian decomposes into two terms. One of them, which arises from what we call entropic regularization, which comes into the uh, comes from the Kale divergence, and the other term, which we call the cost term, arises from the presence of the potential or, or the negative log target distribution v and so we we need to understand how the uh, how the uh, th these two terms uh, behave now in the in the case of um of langevin and wasserstein distance then there's a famous result from the 90s mccann and all 97 that shows that this term is is what we call this um this term is displacement convex. And what that means is that this term is, is greater or equal to zero. So definitely it's, it's not gonna cause us any problems uh, it, it, in terms of establishing the convexity. And then any, convex, any strict strong convexity has to arise from this term. And so there's a, a set of conditions on the potential which guarantee that then that this term is, um, <coughs> is um, the, that, the <coughs> that this term is bounded above from zero. However, this is not the case for the Stein uh, counterpart. In fact, uh, in that case, we, we, we find that this term can actually be, be stri strictly negative definite, in particular if we choose this to be some linear funct function. And so immediately we, we, we realize that um, we, we cannot really expect a nice story like we had for uh, Langevin, because if this is negative definite, then we need much, much stronger constraints on this term to beat the, the negative definiteness of this term. And this suggests that it, it, it's um, it's quite unlikely that we can we could establish exponential convergence to equilibrium for SVGs. And so then the second question we asked is we said, okay, so what if we now started really close to equilibrium? So our initial distribution is actually close to the target distribution. Can we at least establish exponential decay there? So in some basin of the of the uh, of the target distribution, so to speak. And there um, you can actually simplify things a lot because your initial condition is just a perturbation, right, of the target distribution. 
and the calculations simplify quite quite significant. And um, in fact, you can you can show that you can, you get exponential uh, decay near equilibrium if this condition holds, where where um, where this is actually a much nicer condition, and we, we need that lambda is is strictly greater than than, 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 than zero. And in fact, um, we we can show that um, exponential de decay near equilibrium is equivalent to the following inequality, known as the stein poincare inequality, where L is this linear operator here, where we see the TK pi operator appear in, in, the, in, in the first derivative. And so this is interesting because um, for those who are familiar, if, there was, if this was just the identity and this wasn't here, this would just be the standard Poincaré inequality that you get from Langevin dynamics. And the fact that this is a smoothing operator actually makes it harder to establish such a thing. So actually this thing, the smoother it is, the, the harder, the, the less likely it is that you could establish this inequality for lambda greater than zero. And that's already suggestive that, that there's going to be a problem here. And in fact, based on this, we can make the following conclusions. So firstly, um, if the kernel is one that is um, has some inter natural integrability conditions, and moreover the kernel is, 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 has, um, is continuously differentiable in both arguments, then in fact, it's already too smooth for us to obtain a stein poincare inequality, and the stein poincare inequality will only hold for lambda is zero. Secondly, um, translation invariance also works against this. So if you have a, at least in one dimension, if you have a, tra a kernel which is translation invariant, and, and, and so you have this natural decay in the tails of the kernel, um, then immediately the stein poincare inequality cannot hold because, um, because of the behavior in the tails. And it actually can only hold at least for lambda is zero. And so based on this, uh, that would suggest that we could establish exponential convergence at least close to equilibrium if we were to construct a kernel which is non-smooth or non-translation invariant. So um, in particular, we, we, we propose the following matern-based kernel. So we start with a matern kernel, and we multiply on both sides um, 1 over root pi. So that it's weighted in this way. And then if, if we can, uh, uh, um, if there is a constant la lambda tilde such that this condition holds, and this is a very natural condition, it's just establishing uh, conve sufficient convexity of the, of the potential, then you can show that the stein poincare inequality will hold, and it will hold with this constant, which is strictly greater than zero. So that suggests that there is some scope for, um, for um, changing the kernel in such a way that you could, uh, you could get better performance. And so um, motivated by this, we started studying the following kernel, which is uh, an, a, a, an RBF kernel, that except where this is now P, which isn't necessarily two, but it's some number between zero and two. And theory suggests that taking small p um, is advantageous, at least you know for infinitely many particles. And so the question is, does this carry through to a finite particle system? And so as a really toy example, we can say that a one-dimensional problem where we have a mixture of, of four Gaussians, and we, we, we simulated this um, for um, for three different values of p, p is 2, p is 1, p is 0.5. And so just visually what we see uh, for, for the same amount of time, and for visually what we see is that for p is 1, p is 0.5, we obtain much better uh, convergence to the target distribution than we obtain for p is 2. And similarly, if we, if we measure the Wasserstein distance between this mixture distribution and <coughs> and the, uh, the, the output of the SVGD for different p, we see that... Um, P is one, P is 0.5, uh, both recover ex, um, uh, several two orders of magnitude better um, accuracy in terms of uh, in terms of Wasserstein distance. Okay, so so that suggests um, at least for a very very simple toy problem that there's some advantage to taking uh, P um, smaller and smaller. Of course, this leads to a, s a more singular problem, and that might suggest that you require maybe small step size, or uh, if you're using an integrator for your ODE model. They require um, more, more adaptive steps to converge to equilibrium. So what we did here is we, we tried to also count, compare the efficiency with the number of gradient evaluations, and still it was the case that P is 1 was far superior um, in terms of convergence than uh, P is 2, which, which suggests that um, this is a, a beneficial approach. Okay, so just to summarize what we've, what we've learned, um, so this is a very preliminary analysis, and and uh, since since we submitted archive, this has already been uh, 
two or three follow-up papers by different authors which uh, um, which compare and contrast with ours in different ways which is quite exciting um, the SVGD algorithm has an interesting underlying geometric structure which we draw natural parallels to with uh, Langevin we believe that there's no exponential convergence at least for a generally smooth kernel K and um, th so there are a number of future directions we can look at and one of them which I'm, I'm most keen on is understanding um, how how um, how reliably we can we can extend this intuition into finite particle behavior using various um, techniques from statistical physics and mathematics so thank you very much